Well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Howington. I am a soil conservationist at the Natural Resources Conservation Service. We are a branch of the United States Department of Agriculture. And thank you so much, Rowan, and Ann, and Sherry for having me today. I'm very excited to be speaking on the, this wonderful topic of pollinators in your garden. Um, this is a presentation that um, I've been working with Anne with the Master Gardeners for a while now, and I presented um, in a classroom setting back in September. So this is a little different than being in person, um, but I'm hopeful it will still be just as effective, um, even with all this online interaction. Um, so I, I wanna thank them, and I wanna tell you a little bit about what I do. Um, so I am an environmental planner um, with the USDA. I work with farmers and ranchers in San Jose County, and I work with them on resource conservation projects, including irrigation, wildlife habitat, air quality, and soil health. So with all these diff disciplines kind of all working together on, on um, farm and ranch land in the county, I'm really glad that I'm able to kind of focus down a little bit and, and communicate to you the importance of native insects and pollinators, as well as native plants um, that you can grow in your garden to create pollinator habitat which is something that um, both agriculturally and in the urban landscape is something that's gotten a lot of attention in recent years, as you might, you know, as you might be aware of, obviously you're all here to, to learn more. So you're all, I'm sure just as passionate as I am about this topic. Um, and just, just to let you know, we're going to, we're going to save all the questions and answers for the end. Um, so if you see something on the slides that you have questions about or, or something that you want to bring up, um, feel free to hold on to it, and then at the end of this presentation, we, uh, we will do our best to, to answer those as best we can. Um, this is also recorded and will be posted on YouTube at a later date. So if you're trying to remember something about my presentation that you can't, couldn't quite put your finger on it, it's going to be posted on YouTube as well. Um, so I also want to thank the Xerxes Society for their partnership in developing this presentation. And I wish we could have someone from, from their organization here too to help, to help me with the pollinator aspect, but um, they were kind enough to lend a lot of resources to me. So um, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. So first up, we're gonna have a poll and we're gonna, um, we'd like to see what do you hope to take away from this class? Just to get a good idea of where everyone's at here. Hi, Chris. Ann here. We're having a little technical difficulty. Um, okay. So think about how you would answer this poll. Um, unfortunately, let's see here. Well, we're getting some answers anyway, Ann. I'm seeing. Oh, here we go. You? Oh, here we oh, go. Look, it's yes. working. Yes. Oh, I just couldn't see it. Okay. <laughs> okay, here we go. Um, I can already tell you what a lot of people said, but I'm not gonna tell you yet. Give a few more seconds for people who are po poised to keyboard. Okay. Well, what do you wanna take away from this class? And you had many choices. Um, of course, anyone's here wants to know about learning about pollinators. That's 62%, okay. A uh, lot of us want to be able to identify pollinators in my yard. Oh, that's a big one. 63% and the grand prize winner, Chris, guess what? Learning about which plants I put in my garden to attract pollinators. So it looks like you've got the right audience here. Awesome, awesome, fantastic. Well, I'm, I'm glad to see, and, and I agree, I think with this poll, definitely the, the plants for me too is something that I, I'm always interested in learning about. Um, and yeah, I've been seeing a lot of your responses too. Um, so fantastic. Well, I'm glad that everyone's so passionate and, and looking for all this information. I hope that um, I can kind of help everyone out with, with being able to identify the pollinators as well as um, learning more about them as well as which plants can help attract um, pollinators. So let's go to the next slide here. Perfect. So um, before I delve into the species of insects and pollinators and what plants, I wanted to touch on the importance of pollination and just how crucial it is, not only um, for crop production, but also the ecosystem services that 
um, native insects and pollinators provide um, towards the towards all flowering plants. So more than 85% of all flowering plants in the world require an animal to move pollen from one place to another. Um, there are estimated to be about 20,000 different bee species in the world, and they're just one type of animal that um, has pollination services that they can provide. So when you think about the diversity of, of plants in the world and, and the fact that they're still discovering new plant species almost every day, the fact that out of hundreds of thousands of plant species, you have 85% of them that um, potentially require an animal to move pollen. So it's just so crucial to understand that pollination services are really an invaluable ecosystem service that is responsible for, for most of the plants that um, live and thrive today. So I wanted to um, discuss the first class of pollinators, and these are by far most likely the most common and the ones that you most think of, um, and these are the invertebrate pollinators. So these are the pollinators that lack a spinal cord, um, and these mainly make up insects. So if you, if you look in this, in this photograph, you have butterflies, moths, flies and hoverflies, beetles, wasps, and bees. So these are kind of six general classes of invertebrate pollinators. Um, they do provide um, most of the pollination services that are out there, um, especially what most people think of as bees. Um, but I think the goal of this class is to, is to get you thinking that bees are just one species or one family of pollinators. And, and you know, there's um, dozens more of species and, and family of animals that also provide this service. The next um, category are the vertebrate pollinators. So these are the, the animals that have a spinal cord that are able to provide pollination services. These are bats and hummingbirds generally. So you can see here a bat, I believe it is pollinating a saguaro cactus in this photograph. Um, bats are generally nocturnal pollinators. So a lot of the interactions that they have with plants are very, um, very specialized and have evolved to have a beneficial relationship between the plant and the bat. Um, so there, we're, we're not really going to touch too much on bats today, um, but they're a very important pollinator for certain, for certain species that they have a very mutual uh, interaction with. And the next class of vertebrate pollinators would be your hummingbirds. Um, so this is a pretty obvious category. Um, the, the wonderful thing about hummingbirds is that their beaks, the way their, their beaks are shaped, are have evolved to access nectar in the plant. And by accessing the nectar, they are also providing pollination services by the pollen rubbing onto their fur. And when they transfer to the next flower and reach for that nectar, um, they're also providing, um, they're also pollinating um, that plant. So we'll, we'll go into this uh, B section next. And this is a fun quiz that I'd like everyone to do. This is a, a diagram that that made it across the New York Times and a lot of large scientific studies that tested the general public's knowledge of, of, what a, of how many out of these 10 are bees. So this is a fun one. Take your best guess. Feel free to look through all the numbers and, and try and see how many out of these 10 you think are bees. Well, Chris, I, when I took this, I failed. So. <laughs> this will be exciting to see those. <laughs> I think the first time I took this, I failed too. And we'll give you all, we'll give you all a couple minutes to, to look through this and, and really get a good idea. Um, so, you know, as you're looking through this, you know, a lot of these insects are very indistinguishable. Um, and, the, and one thing I want to point out to you all is just the diversity of insects. And we're not even looking at the full breadth of, of you know, insect diversity that's out here. This is just a, a simple quiz that um, was, was rolling around, um, was rolling around, you know, news media and, and, and scientific journals. And um, this is a good segue into, into our bee discussion topic that we're gonna go into. All right. 
So it looks like I'm seeing results from the poll, which is fantastic. Let's see. So it's a very wide range of guesses, actually. Very interesting. Um, and it looks like the majority, just by a hair, did get this correct. So in this picture, there are six species of bees out of 10. So out of these 10, there are six species of bees. And 22% of the class got it right, which is, which is fantastic. Um, that is better than the, than the actual poll in the study that the, that the scientists used when, when doing this study. I believe in their study, only 14% of participants guessed correctly that there were six bees in this photograph. So if you're still wondering which ones are actually bees, number two is a bumblebee. Number four, I believe, is a sweat bee. Number six is a mining bee. Number seven is a, is a mason bee, a large mason bee. Number eight is what you probably guessed, it's a honeybee, a European honeybee. And number 10 is a metallic green sweat bee. So the one that most people probably got incorrectly was number nine. That's actually a velvet ant. And a velvet ant's not actually an ant, it's a member of the wasp family. So kind of the common name of the velvet ant is a little deceiving. Um, and, in the, and in the study I'm referencing, um, that was the most commonly, uh, that was the most common error of this quiz was number nine. Um, I'm sure most people realize that number one is a fly, number three is a butterfly, and number five is a grasshopper. Um, but from this, from this um, you know, quiz, I just wanted to get a better idea of where everyone's knowledge was at in the diversity of bees. Um, so I'm, I'm happy that we were able to do this poll. So continuing on. This is a honeybee. And, and this is what most people think of when you think of bees. When you, when you ask anyone on the street, you know, what is this? They're gonna say a bee. Um, the European honeybee is a highly domesticated animal. It essentially at this point is livestock. It, you know, it, it is not native to the United States, actually. Um, and most people think that it is. Most people think that there's maybe one or two species of bees, when in reality, worldwide, there's about 20,000. And I think with, just within the United States, there's about 3,600 species of bees, they estimate. Um, so what I want to you know, get across today is that um, the European honeybee is just one very small aspect of a wide ecosystem of bee species that are out there that do provide pollination services. And, and in fact, most of the native insects highly specialize in the native plants that are found in California. While the honeybee is more of a generalist and it's more of, of, of a domesticated livestock where it's transported from one area to another in order to provide pollination services for, for many of the crops that are grown today. So I apologize if my, if my speaker's crackling a little bit. Hopefully the static gets a little bit better. Um, I'll do my best to, to speak more clearly. So this is a bumblebee, the rusty patch bumblebee. Um, you might have heard this in the news in the last couple of years, but the US Fish and Wildlife Service in 2017 actually listed this bee as endangered. Um, so this was the first high profile um, species of bee that garnered a lot of media attention a couple years ago because it was placed on the endangered species list. And this, this singular event really brought a lot of attention to the issue that, you know, small pollinators that you wouldn't necessarily think of, like a European honeybee, are very much at risk. Um, the rusty patch bumblebee is found across the Midwest and East Coast into Canada. Its range is so wide, yet the fact that it's endangered really brought home to people that the landscape has changed. So, somewhere along the way, you know, how we used to look at the world, how, how abundant insects and pollinators were at one point, it has really changed in the last 100 years. Um, so the rusty patch bumblebee really garnered a lot of attention towards the idea that, you know, there's not just one bee species out there, there's thousands. They, they are all valuable um, and they're highly diverse in, in where they live and, and what plants that they, that they pollinate. This is a longhorn bee. So you can just see the, 
the diversity and, and you know, how different all these different species of bees look. Um, and you can see that this one's fur is highly adapted to collecting pollen. This is a carpenter bee that is, is a mimic of a leaf cutter bee. Um, it's, it's just a fantastic specimen here. And, it, and you know, it's dark black and, and, it, and it does look a lot different from other species of bees. This is a leaf cutter bee. Um, and you can see too, just the, the differences in, in all of these bee species and just really cool pictures to show. This photo here is a metallic green sweat bee. Um, these are very easy bees to spot because they are so reflective in the sun. Um, they are, they're, you know, very reflective, very green, um, fantastic bee to see out in the wild. So my goal with these pictures is just to show you that there really is so much diversity among bees, as well as, you know, all the other insects and pollinators that are out there as well. So something that, that might be useful to you all is understanding how bees nest and, and if you can identify them out in your own garden or when you're out hiking or in natural areas. Um, so hopefully this presentation will, will give you the clues and the cues so you can kind of understand where bees are, you know, in, in your own space or in the natural spaces. And there are generally three basic types of bee nesting. Um, the first one is ground nesting. Now ground nesting composes about 70% of all the bee species worldwide, and they are generally solitary bee nesters. So the ground nesters, they typically burrow, they either make their own nests in the ground, or they access um, other animal nests, such as ant holes, rodent holes, um, and, and burrows and things like that. Um, so look out for these structures, you know, in your lawns and in your gardens. A lot of times what you'll think is an ant hill is actually a, a bees or wasps nest. So um, what I want to get across with this today is that bare ground is good. You know, bare ground is important. Just because there's not a plant growing somewhere doesn't mean that it's actually a barren. You know, uh, these ground nesting bees prefer open ground that they can nest in. So, you know, if you have a patch of garden space where you're not really sure what to do with it, you know, you have plants here and there, you know, sporadically, but you have, a, you know, patches of bare ground and there's not a thick layer of mulch over it, consider leaving it. And, and as you provide poll like pollinator plants that, that provide that benefit for pollinators, you might have bees that, that potentially ground nest in those bare patches. Um, so the ground nesting is, is extremely important for a majority of the insect population out there. So this is just an example of a typical life cycle of a ground nesting bee. In this example, we're using a mining bee. Um, so mining bees in this example generally spend a year underground um, where you can see here on the rightmost and bottom images, that yellow blob is actually a pollen grain. That the, that the mother mining bee essentially collected, and it's basically been compacted into this large grain. And what you can see here is that when the mining bee nests underground, it lays its egg on top of the pollen grain. That pollen grain serves as a source of nutrition for the larva, as you can see in, this, in these bottom photos. So as that larva feeds on that pollen that was collected in the season before, it starts to emerge out of the ground where it'll then spend just a few weeks as an adult um, pollinating plants. So with these ground nesting bees, their life cycle is so solitary and, and they spend so much of their life underground. Once they, once they pop up out of the ground, they have a few weeks where they provide, where in that window, they provide pollination services. So that's why it's so crucial um, for the general public to, to understand that ground nesting bees are so important as general pollinators, because a lot of times, you know, you'll have, you'll have early, early pollinators that come out in February and March, and then you'll have your April, May insects that come out, you know, all the way up until basically the fall and into winter. Um, in California, I believe most bee species, solitary ground nesters do spend winter underground. Um, so that's why it's important not to, not to disturb that ground, that open ground that you have in your garden or natural space, because you never know if there's a, a pollinator that's currently, you know, overwintering um, underground. So that few weeks as an adult are really so crucial for them to be able to find flowers and, and pollen. 
The second type of nesting that I want to touch on today is the stem and wood nesting bees. Um, bees generally nest in either dead standing wood or hollow wood um, or inside the stem of, of living plants themselves. So these are a few example pictures here of, of what that habitat, habitat might look like. So you see in that center picture, I mean, I think this is most likely along the San Joaquin or Merced River. Um, this is a just standing dead wood. This is fantastic um, nesting space for a lot of, for a lot of insects um, because it's easy to burrow in and create that nesting spot. Um, and you can see in the leftmost photo an example of a bee that's lodged itself in there. And, and that's, um, you know, that's what it calls its home. And you can see the larva there on the, on the leftmost photo. And then as well as a lot of, you know, dead standing trunk trunks or, or large branches that are, that have fallen on the ground. These, you know, wood spaces are, are great habitat for them as well. Um, so th this composes about 30% more or less of all the of all the bees out there. The final type of nesting. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Roll it back for one second. These are a couple examples of stem and wood nesting bees that you might find. The leftmost photo is a valley carpenter bee. This is a fantastic California pollinator to see. It's it's a huge carpenter bee, very big. It looks just like a bumblebee. Um, but these, these are stem and wood nesters, as well as mason bees. Um, they're a great example as well, you know, of one emerging from its hole. So a lot of times you'll see woodpecker holes in the wood. They might use existing woodpecker holes or they might um, come up, they might have the ability to actually burrow into the wood um, themselves as well. One thing I wanna point out is that with carpenter bees, in a lot of places they're viewed as pests because they do nest in fences or or wood in your house or you know in if you have wooden walls or a wooden cabin um, they do nest in there and do create some problems I believe that most of the pest issues with carpenter bees are actually the eastern carpenter bee um, so I think they are generally the the pest variety I do know for a fact that in this photo on the left the valley carpenter bee um, I do not believe that it is considered a pest because it's very it's very solid, solitary, so it's kind of low impact as far as the amount of damage it does on wood. The third um, and most, I guess, common and public knowledge type of nesting is hive nesting bees. So that the, the remarkable thing to me is just the, the lack of bee species that are actually hive nesters. Um, it's assumed that less than 1% of all bee species worldwide are actual hive nesting bees. Yet, you know, in, in, in our knowledge, in our viewpoint, hive nesting bees are almost all that we see out there. They're the most visible. You can see, you know, along the highways, especially in the Central Valley, you'll see large hive boxes. If you've ever driven by an almond orchard while the flowers are blooming, there's hive boxes everywhere. Um, hives are really specifically just for European honeybees. Um, you know, there are a few more bee species here and there that are hive nesting, but in general, European honeybees are really the minority in how they live and how they work. Um, so one thing I really wanna just get across to you all is that hive nesting is by no means the norm for bee species. You know, as far as the European honey go, honeybee goes, that's very much, you know, the normal with them. Um, but in general, hive nesting is, is as a minority among bees. So I want to transition a little bit to, to the hoverflies. Um, these are very much bee mimics. You can see in these photos, it's almost indistinguishable, the two bottom photos, um, you know, as far as what, what is a bee and what isn't. And the Xerxes Society provided these fantastic photos on, of their website. Um, so, you know, one thing I want to mention on the bottom, you have a, a surfed fly and it, it, it looks so similar to bees, especially the, the ones on the bottom left. Um, the thing about hoverflies is that their wings are generally a lot more translucent than a bee species, um, as well as they're generally smaller, um, but they are very hard to you know, ID in the wild without a clear photo. Um, but the, the pollination services they do provide um, are just beginning to be understood. They were flies in the in the past previously were not considered pollinators they were considered pests and nuisances um, but 
we're starting to discover that hoverflies have a very specific relationship with lots of plants and they provide pollination services that we're just beginning to understand. So you can see the top right photo is, is a fly pollinated in a milkweed plant, which is essential for the monarch butterfly. And you have on that, um, on that golden rod, you have that pollinator there as well. Um, so they're typically generalist pollinators, but hoverflies do have a lot of specific interactions as well. So they're a very important class of pollinators that I definitely want to touch on. The next class of pollinators are wasps. So these are probably the, the most misunderstood of the insects out there. People generally tend to think they're aggressive and, and really don't have any sort of beneficial use in, in the world. Um, however, the diversity of wasps and, and the services that, are, that they provide, they are really the predators of the insect world. They are kind of the, the apex predator and they're considered beneficial insects because they actually help with pest populations on plants. So aphids, tarantulas, flies, you know, things that are generally considered as pests or nuisances, wasps are actually their main predators. Um, and they do provide pollination services as well. So, you know, wasps, although many a times they look scary, you know, yellow jackets, they can be intimidating. They do provide limited pollination services, but as a whole, the ecosystem services they provide um, totally justify their presence and, and the need to conserve wasp species out there. So now I wanna go through a, just a, a few photos to really bring home Chris, the importance. Excuse, yeah. Excuse me, hold on for just a second. Let's, let's give you a second to get a drink of water. And before you okay. go on, Give everyone a Fantastic. time, maybe if they have some questions they want to put down real quickly or something they want to chat with the rest of us, gives them a couple seconds to do that. Sure. Yeah, I'll slow it down a bit. <laughs> no, 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 that's no, that's okay. It's just I thought you needed a drink <laughs> of water. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate it. Awesome. I'm already seeing great questions in here. That's fantastic. And I apologize if my if my speaker's crackling a little bit. I think when I when I move my head, it, it jostles my my headset around a little bit. So that might be why you're hearing some crackling. Okay, so continuing on, um, I want to talk about what a world with and without pollinators looks like. So in this photo, that should say a world with pollinators. Um, you see, you know, a grocery store and and Right now, things are a little weird with grocery stores and food supplies. This might not be the grocery store that you're seeing. You know, you might be missing eggs, milk, flour, toilet paper, grain, rice. Those things might be missing right now, but those don't really have anything to do with pollinators. But, you know, in a perfect world, in a perfect grocery store, you know, six months ago, this might be what your grocery store looked like. This might be what your grocery store looks like if we didn't have pollinators. So you can see there's a huge difference in food abundance and availability um, that's out there with, pollen, with pollinators. So you can see things like apples, citrus, avocados, blueberries, almonds, um, a lot of vegetables. And you can just see the differences here in the produce section between you know, full pollinator services being provided versus no pollination services being provided. So I think this photo really does a great job of, of showing just how crucial pollinators are to um, our food security, our nation's food security. They, bees and, and other pollinators are literally a matter of food security for, for the people that, that rely on these crops to, to eat. This is just another graphic of the dairy section, which is something that most people wouldn't think of as relying on pollinators. Um, so this should say a world with pollinators, and this is your general dairy, yogurt, cheese, milk section. This might be what it looks like without those pollination services being provided. Um, so, you know, when I first saw this graphic, I was wondering why, um, you know, dairy products are so limited without, without bees and pollinators to provide that benefit. It's because species, plant species like clover 
um, and other flowering plants that grow in pastures and rangelands across the country, bees are the main pollinator for species like clover. And, and when you think about what cows and other livestock eat, they eat the plants that are successful. They eat what's out there on the pasture. Many of the plants that grow on native pastures and rangelands are pollinator dependent plants. They're not all, you know, wind dispersed um, pollen like, like many grasses are. Um, a lot of them are flowering plants that rely on bees. So when you look at these two graphics, one of the big things that goes away is are things like the, the clover butters, the, 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 if you buy your milk that's from grass fed or, or native pasture cattle, um, the food that they're eating, the calories that they're ingesting come from plants that rely on pollinators. Um, so I think this is a great graphic and understanding that not only is it fruits and vegetables that rely on pollination services, it's dairy products that rely on pollination services too. So wh why I'm showing you these photos is because in the last few years, scientists and, and the general public has come to understand that there is a serious lack of insect abundance in recent years compared to when people were kids. You know, you hear stories, you know, both in person and online of people 50 years ago growing up when they used to take road trips with their parents, they'd have to wash their car along the way because their windshield would be completely full and they wouldn't be able to see. They'd have to pull over and get a car wash midway through the road trip. And now, you know, you take a six hour road trip and you, you maybe have to wipe your windshield off once. Um, so these kinds of stories of, of nostalgia back when people grew up either in the countryside or in, in the suburbs of all the insects that just used to be around. And now people growing up in this day and age, it's not as abundant. There's something missing. And in this New York Times article from a couple of years ago, um, they titled it, The Insect Apocalypse is Here. And, and we're starting to understand that the actual amount of insects that are there is decreasing at a rapid rate. If you look at the, the proposed insect abundance that was here 50 years ago, you're looking at a stark drop in population and abundance numbers um, in both the diversity of insects as well as their populations are generally in, in decline. So I think the first thing is to understand why they are in decline. So I think we have another poll here that you can all um, chip in on as far as what you think are the main reasons um, for insect decline, whether it's one issue or multiple issues. I see we have a message from Denise about um, this month's most current National Geographic cover, which is a story on the insect apocalypse. You'll miss them when they're gone. Wow, see, that's a, that's a very fitting title for, for this presentation, very timely. Okay, so um, it looks like the poll results are in. So, wow, so definitely the number one answer on here, which I, I was expecting is pesticides, as the, is what this class put as the number one reason. Um, following that, at 92% of the class put habitat loss due to farming and urbanization. Third would be climate change. Fourth would be pollution, and fifth, on this list is invasive species. So these are all great responses. Um, and, and in this question, there really is no correct answer. It really is all of the above. You know, as, as people and humans, we really try to identify one problem so that we can come up with the solution that will fix the problem. The really tough part about this question and understanding why and how these insects and pollinators are in decline is because it's such a multifaceted issue. Yes, pesticides are an issue. They're a major issue, but so is habitat loss. I'd argue that that issue in itself is more important than pesticide use, um, as well as pollution. 
the, the introduction of a lot of native invasive species that either attack pollinators or compete with the plants that pollinators um, need for their own survival and nutrition. So it's by no means just one, um, one issue, one reason why insects worldwide are in decline. It's really a multifaceted issue with so many difficult solutions. It, it really requires a lot of discourse, a lot of understanding, and it really requires um, effort from all sides and all disciplines um, versus just saying, you know, pesticides are the number one issue. You know, it's, it's such a broad um, spectrum of reasons, um, which makes this, this issue so important um, and also so difficult. So now we're going to shift a little bit into um, the native plants. We've kind of touched on the diversity of pollinators. Um, hopefully the, the diagrams I showed you of, of how bees nest, as well as some examples to, to put in your mind of what pollinators might look like. Um, we're going to kind of transition a little bit in, in what native plants are, the benefits that they provide, um, and, and some California native species that you can put into your gardens. Um, that will help. So funnily enough, as I was, you know, working with Anne and, and through this presentation, I, I stumbled upon this article here, how and why to use native plants from just about not even two weeks ago. Um, so, you know, as I was reading this article, what, what um, this author was saying really does fall in line with, with this presentation. Um, so I'm just trying to get across how, how much in the, in the news, at the forefront this pollinator issue is, um, as well as native plants now, which are gaining a lot more understanding. So I'd just like to start with a general overview of native plants for those that aren't really aware um, or just have, you know, are looking to learn more. Um, so native plants in general, um, the fantastic thing about California is at least one third of all native plant species in California are found nowhere else in the world. So these species are known as endemic. So plants that are endemic to California are truly specialized. They've evolved to our unique climate and soils. Um, a lot of these plants are only specific to certain microclimates and certain soils in the state of California. Um, the wonderful thing about, about California flora is you, if you go up to Humboldt County, you're gonna find a completely different plant community than if you go down to San Diego County and then all, all in between, up and down the coast, in the Central Valley, in the mountains, in the deserts, you have this incredible variety of plants that have specifically evolved to the small subregions in which they live. Um, so with, with these native species that are endemic, and even the ones that aren't, even the ones that are found, they could be found just on the West Coast, they could be found you know, in, in all of North America, or they could be found worldwide. The wonderful thing about California natives is that they provide specialized benefits for the wildlife that are found here. And, and that's in contrast to a lot of the nursery stock plants that you might find at a garden variety store or you know, a local nursery. Those plants that are not you know, truly native plants don't necessarily provide that same benefit towards wildlife. So if there's one thing I really want you to take home today, it's that understanding that for the wildlife that lives here, for the insects and pollinators that live here, California native species are going to have the best, um, the best impact in supporting their habitat and their nutrition. Another important anecdote that I just wanna add is that not all flowers provide pollen and nectar, and not all flowers that do provide pollen and nectar are suitable for every pollinator. So pollen, for example, pollen grains are ac actually a protein that many insects rely on. Um, they're a nutritious protein. Well, nectar isn't actually a protein, it's a carbohydrate. It's a sugary li liquid that plants create out of their nectar glands. And not all insects are attracted to nectar. Um, and not all animals that are attracted to nectar like pollen. So if you think about hunting, hummingbirds, they're not thinking about pollinating services that they provide. They're not they don't understand that, you know, if I move from this flower to the next one, I'm going to, you know, cause fertilization of that new flower and it's going to make more flowers. No, they're not thinking of that. They're thinking, 
I sense nectar. This plant is secreting sugary liquid that's going to help me survive and reproduce. Um, so they're going to be attracted to that nectar. And along the way, they pick up pollen. And when they pick up pollen, it sticks to their fur, it sticks to their feathers. So when they move to the next plant, um, they're not necessarily actively pollinating. They're more incidentally pollinating. You know, by seeking out that nectar, they are providing pollination services. So I just wanted to clarify that, that, you know, it's so interesting, the differences between, you know, how pollen and nectar and what species interact with which, which, with which um, energy source. So the most important thing that you could take away is that it's very important that pollinator habitat contains a diversity of natives that bloom throughout the growing season. If you think back to that mining bee example of it living underground, when it wakes up, when it's out of the ground, it has a few week window, you know, two or three weeks to maybe a month where it's actively pollinating. So when it comes out and it's, you know, buzzing through your garden looking for something, if you only necessarily have something that says, let's say blooms in May and all your flowers bloom in May, but you know, potentially the insect that rises in February, it's not really gonna have anything to pollinate. So it's gonna have to move on and look for something else. So that pollinator diversity, oh, I'm sorry, excuse me, that plant diversity is so crucial um, in establishing successful pollinator habitat. Another thing that's extremely important other than diversity is flower shape. Um, so the wonderful thing about California plants is the, di the morphology of flowers is so vast and varied. Um, all these flower shapes cater to different insects and pollinators. So if you think of a, a flower with tubular or funnel shaped flowers, for example, um, a fuchsia or a columbine or a delphinium, these are just a few examples of California natives with, with tube or funnel shaped flowers. Um, these are gonna be more attractive to hummingbirds, butterflies, and moths. And the reason for that is because generally at the very base of these flowers are where the nectar is secreted. That's where the nectar is produced. So the insects and animals that are going to be most successful have the longest tongues, have the longest beaks to be able to get into that flower and get the nectar they're looking for. And I have a few examples on the next slide as well. Other than the tube and funnel shaped flowers, you have flowers that are more broad or cup shaped. These would be like your sunflowers, your asters, your daisies, your poppies. Um, these are gonna be more attractive to the, ant, to the pollinators that actually sit on the pad of the flower. So species like bees, hoverflies, butterflies, um, even wasps and beetles. These broad and cup-shaped flowers are really going to be attractive to them so that they can sit on the pad of the flower and collect pollen and nectar. So these are just some examples of great natives that have those distinct flower morphologies that cater to different pollinators. So on the left-hand side, you can see these are tidy tips. They are a, um, a species that's in the sunflower family. They're a fantastic California native. So you can see it has that large head-shaped flower, or I should say bunch, bunches of, of individual flowers that the, that the insect can sit on and collect pollen. And then on the bottom, you have your classic California poppy. Um, these are your cup-shaped flowers. And you might see, you know, you might have seen pictures or even, in, even yourselves where bumblebees typically like to burrow in there and, and take a little nap in these cup-shaped flowers. On the right hand side are the tubular and funnel shaped flowers. So this red flower here is a California fuchsia. It's a great California native to have in your garden. Um, you can see just how long that flower shape is and you can see that hummingbird at the bottom photo. It's really gonna be attracted to the nectar that's deep in that plant. So as that hummingbird burrow, like burrows its beak inside that flower, it's going to incidentally collect pollen from that fuchsia. And then you can see here on that purple sage on the bottom, it has the same type of, of you know, flower shape, a little different, um, but the same deal. You can see that, that hummingbird with its beak, you know, being able to really get in there and collect that nectar, incidentally collecting pollen as well.
so now we'll get into some some great California native plants that that you could start out with um, for your garden if you're just getting started. Um, you know, as I go through these, these, this is by no means an exhaustive list. These are just a few four or five species that I could think of that would be a great start. Um, really, the wonderful thing about California native plants is there's so many out there, and in depending on where you go, where what nurseries you shop at you know, how these plants are labeled, you're gonna see such a wide variety of plants to start with. Um, so, you know, you might have seen something recently that's completely different than what's on my list. So if you do have questions about that, feel free to ask. I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, but then again, you know, I, I don't go to nurseries as much as I should every day. So, you know, I'll just stick with this list. And then if you have specific questions, you're more than welcome to ask them in the chat. So to start, I'd say uh, if you're starting from scratch, bare patch of ground, not sure what to do, not sure what to plant, a safe bet would be California buckwheat, Areogonum species. Um, these are widely available. I do believe in most nurseries. They are essentially a, a chaparral obligate. They are a, a wildflower that is extremely successful in chaparral habitat um, because they are so drought tolerant. And they are also very low management. Um, the buckwheats out there are typically found in a lot of sandy soils or well-drained soils. They really don't need a whole lot of water and they like full sun. So you'll typically see them on hillsides, on, on, on freeways, or if you're hiking in Chaparral closer to the coast or in Southern California, they'll be all over the place. And they're more of a summer, fall bloomer which is in contrast to a lot of annual wildflowers that California might have. Um, so the wonderful thing about buckwheat is it truly provides pollen for a general overview, a wide array, a, a wide array excuse me, of insects. So I've seen butterflies, I've seen bees, I've seen hoverflies, I've seen wasps on buckwheat. Um, so as far as starting out with something, they're a really good option because they do provide a general attraction for a lot of species of pollinator. Um, the one thing I'd say about buckwheat is depending on what type of buckwheat you might purchase, they do get a little bushy. So if you're working with limited space, you might have to cut them back after they've flowered and gone to seed in the late winter. Um, so I would suggest that if you're worried about them getting a little big, they do grow a little, a little large and bushy, um, you know, after a few years as well. All right, so moving on, you can never go wrong with salvia species. And salvia um, is, a, is a sage. It's in the, the sage and mint family. Um, California is blessed with a wonderful diversity of, of sages that all provide great pollination services out there. Um, the pictures and, and species I have up here are by no means a limited example. These are just a couple of probably the most common ones that you'd find that are truly native. Um, you know, I wanna, I wanna focus your attention to mainly black sage, Salvia mellifera. This, along with buck, buckwheat, is really a chaparral obligate. It's found all over Chaparral, California. Um, it smells fantastic. The, the pollination services it provides are great for hummingbirds and butterflies, as well as bees, um, as well as chia sage. That might be one that's more widely found in California. So, you know, in this class, there's a lot of people from people from all over in this class, which is fantastic. I saw an Irvine. I'm from Orange County. So I saw someone from Irvine. I saw someone from Clear Lake. I saw someone from Petaluma. Um, with this list, I would say the best place to start is with plants that are found in a lot of places in California. With a lot of these California natives, there are species that are only found in certain subregions. And so if you say, let's say you're in Modesto and you plant a sage that's only found in the Mojave Desert, that's gonna have less of a benefit um, for the insects and animals that live in the Central Valley versus if you were to plant that in the Mojave Desert. So, you know, again, by no means in a, a limited list here, um, I'm sure local nurseries have a wide availability of salvias. I do want to mention, though, that um, the salvias that they might sell you are not necessarily native. They could be 
hybrids or varieties or cultivars. So I'd say just ask, see what they have. Um, but chia sage and hummingbird sage are really good um, varieties to plant, uh, excuse me, species to plant as well. The next species I wanted to draw your attention to is probably one that's um, been buzzing around social media and, and news lately, and that's milkweed. And milkweed, if, if you weren't already aware, is the host plant for the monarch butterfly. I want to highlight one species of milkweed today, and that's narrow leaf milkweed, Asclepius fascicularis. This milkweed is generally found in almost every county in California. The very interesting thing about California milkweeds is that the, where they're found and where they grow successfully is so region specific. These milkweeds are so highly adapted to our microclimates and our soils that it might not, again, with the sage topic, it might not be best to plant an Indian milkweed if you're in the Central Valley perhaps, versus, you know, if you live in a place where those milkweed are, are found, you know, that, and they are available in nurseries, that could be a great option. But today I'm just gonna stick to narrow leaf milkweed as, a, as my, my recommendation um, for a good species to plant because it's so generally found in the state of California. You really can't go too far off um, with planting it if you can. Um, so you might have seen um, in the news lately that the monarch butterfly, specifically the Western monarch butterfly, has been facing serious decline. It's been facing a, a, a lot of threats lately and it is being considered on the threatened and endangered species list by um, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. It has not been listed yet. Um, however, as they're noticing population numbers, we're seeing a really sharp decline since the 1980s in the, in the population numbers of Western monarchs that nest in, you might've seen them nest in eucalyptus trees in Pismo Beach or you know, Santa Barbara along the California coast. Um, so I wanna point you to the most right picture here. This caterpillar, I took that photo, I believe in Oakland last year. This monarch is actually living on a tropical milkweed. Um, so if there's one thing I wanna get across to you today, it's that just be wary of nursery labeling of milkweed. Um, nurseries will generally just do a a general marketing of milkweed them, of itself. They might not give you the species, but if you're unsure, just ask, because what we're seeing a lot, and especially in the past five or 10 years, is that nurseries are selling tropical milkweed, Asclepius uh, curasavica. This is actually found in Central America. It's not native to California um, historically. And if you do already have it, I just suggest cutting, cutting it back in the winter you know, no big deal. I, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to tell you to rip it out because it does provide benefit to the monarch butterfly. The, the issue does lie in the fact that it's very susceptible to, to aphid, oleander aphids. It's not accustomed to the climate and soils that, are, that the native milkweeds are found in. So when you're looking at a Western monarch butterfly that's trying to get nutrition from the leaf tissue as well as from the pollen and nectar, that the, that the milkweed provides. It doesn't have that same benefit um, compared to a native milkweed species, although it is very valuable. So I'd suggest just, just look around for milkweeds, ask your local nursery if, if they do have native mil milkweed. Um, if you already have tropical milkweed, I'd suggest after it's gone to flower, cut it back in the winter because it has been shown in the past that monarch, um, excuse me, tropical milkweed, it can confuse monarchs on their migration route. So they might potentially um, nest there and, and make larva and at that tropical milkweed plant when they should be migrating. So the tropical milkweed kind of have a, has a different life cycle compared to the native milkweed species. And on the bottom here um, are two tarantula hawks on narrow leaf milkweed as well. And tarantula hawks are a, a fantastic wasp species that are found in the Southwest. They are, a, are really a fantastic predatory insect. They apparently, they have one of the most painful insect stings in the world. I think they're potentially top five, considered top five. Um, 
but their story is kind of neat. And if anyone has questions about them later, we can talk about them later. Um, but you know, monarchs are not the only species that really loves milkweed, but they are very much um, the life cycle of a native milkweed and the life cycle of a monarch butterfly are extremely intertwined. So I'd suggest plant milkweed habitat wherever you can. It's going to have a benefit for the monarch butterfly. The next species that is most likely also widely available is going to be your Ceanothus species. California has a rich diversity of Ceanothus species as well as um, a lot of hybrids that are, have been crossed together to make um, you know, nursery and landscape available Ceanothus. Um, Ceanothus prefers full sun to partly, sh partly shaded habitat. It, um, it does grow very large and bushy, as you can see in the bottom picture here. So if, if you are considering it, make sure you have enough room for it in your garden. Um, it's really attractive to a lot of species of butterfly. I think on any given on any given Ceanothus, you'll have anywhere between three or six butterflies that rely on that, either to lay their eggs or for the for the pollination services that they provide. Um, so just a couple of cultivars that you might see in nurseries are Ray Hartman, Concha, or Valley Violet. Um, I'm not as familiar with successfully establishing Ceanothus. Um, but I do know that they are very drought tolerant. So, you know, don't, don't overwater them by any, by any means. Um, but, you know, take a look at what Ceanothus are available and, and try to find ones that are less variegated and more, and more true to their native, um, you know, their native counterparts that you find on a hike. And last but not, last but not least, um, these are the annual species that are found throughout California. So the, the previous plants that I touched on are mainly perennial. Um, the, the habit of growth is purely perennial where once they flower and go to seed, they remain all year long until they then flower again um, in the subsequent seasons. While with the annual species, bees really come up in between early and late spring is when these annuals come up. And this is, these annuals, these wildflowers are really good for the ground nesting bees because when those ground nesting bees come out of the ground and they have that few week window, they're going to be looking for these annuals that also have that few week window of flowering because with a lot of these plants, as soon as they flower, they've put all their energy into making this flower so that, so that some animal can come collect the pollen and transfer it, you know, to, to another plant so that it can sex, successfully reproduce. So this is by no means an exhaustive list. There's hundreds of different wildflower species that are found in California, as well as you know wherever you might find them um, in nurseries or garden stores. Um, but this is just a couple examples that I, that I think are some good ideas that are probably going to be the, the easiest to find. Um, so that generally is the California poppy, you know, pretty cut and dry with that. You know, lupin, um, you can see on the bottom left, that's the valley carpenter bee on a lupin species. Um, baby blue eyes, those are the blue flowers that are in the rightmost image, a great borage flower to plant, um, you know, grows very, you know, cohab it cohabitates with a lot of poppies found in the wild. Um, Phacelia, that the plant on the top image, that purple flower, that's very much a, a spring annual that comes about on, on hillsides. You might have, if you've seen super bloom photos, a lot of the photo, a lot of the phacelias really voraciously bloom in those seasons during really great rain years. And then on the bottom photo, you have a woodland clarkia. Um, that's a great, fantastic wildflower that also provides a lot of great services. So with these annual species, when you're, when you're planting them, you're mainly going to find them from seed. In fact, I believe you really only find them from seed. And I encourage you with the seed, there's really the only real trick to getting them established is just broadcast seeding. So just kind of throwing seed where you have those you know, bare patches of ground. I really recommend planting these plants in bunches and patches of habitat. You can see in the rightmost photo, that's a cover crop trial in the Central Valley on an almond orchard. Um, so the way these were planted were in long rows. You don't, you don't have to plant it that way. Um, but as far as that, 
patches of bare ground where you're not really doing anything, those are fantastic spots for, for broadcasting and throwing seed on the ground and giving it a little bit of supplemental water to get it started. Um, but the beautiful thing about California wildflowers in these annuals is that winter, winter rains are really what get them established. There's really no secret um, to getting them going other than the winter rains. Um, so I'd recommend the best time to plant wildflower seed would be in the fall, depending on the predictions of drought and weather patterns. I would recommend anywhere between early to mid October to early to mid November. The general rule of thumb for annual species to plant seed in is October 15th. Um, but what we've noticed in, in recent years is that we've had a lot of late rains. Our first rain is very late in the fall. So when people plant on that strict October 15th deadline, they might not get rain for a month or a month and a half, even up till Thanksgiving. And that's actually what happened la last fall. If you remember, we didn't really get our first rain until right around Thanksgiving. Um, so the people that planted October 15th, their plants right now are, are a lot less successful because if they didn't have to provide, if they didn't supplement that time with water, you know, their plant, their seed does not recruit as quickly as let's say people that planted at the first of November this year. Well, they only had to wait one or two weeks until they got rain. Um, so check their weather report. That's my recommendation. You know, look for that October, November timeline to, to plant annual wildflower seed. Um, if you are interested in doing that. So just some, some plants that I, I'd recommend not putting in your garden for pollinator habitat are the ones on the left. These are your highly variegated, highly cultivated nursery stock plants that you find in large garden stores or even small local nurseries. These types of plants, really they, they provide little to no habitat value. Their flowers aren't able to really produce viable pollen or nectar for the insects and, and animals that live in California. Um, they've just been so genetically modified to be you know, beautiful to have long flowering periods. I'd say if you're looking to establish a pollinator garden, to really just shy away from these and to focus on, on, the, on the natives that you, that you can find. Um, and again, on the right, going back to the tropical milkweed, this is an example of what it looks like flowering. So you can see the leaves. Um, they are very, very broad leaves, very green. And this is in contrast to a lot of milk, native milkweed leaves. The native milkweed le leaves that I showed you in the previous slide, they're very long and thin and they look really different as well as the, the flower color of this. They're very, they're very beautiful plants, these tropical milkweeds. Um, but, but again, they're, they're not found in California historically. Um, and they, they have shown to confuse monarchs on their migration. So if you see these in nurseries, I'd ask if they have any native alternatives. Um, if you do already have tropical milkweed in your garden, again, no big deal. I'd say right now the best course of action is to cut it back in the winter. You know, cut it down a little bit, you know, give the monarchs a chance to go along their migration, to look for other things as far as pollen goes um, and you know that nectar goes and then wait for the, for the milkweed to come back a little bit. So last but not least are some real life examples. Um, so hopefully these give you a good idea of what successful native garden habitat might look like. Um, one thing I wanna note is on the left hand picture, you know, you have a lot of patchy ground here. Um, this, this gardener decided to go with a thick mulch layer, um, which is really helping with weed control, it, it, it seems. Um, with the one thing that I'd say, excuse me, the one thing I'd say with this is that with so much ground currently mulched over, there's less area for um, ground nesting bees to nest on their garden. Um, you know, so if, if you're thinking of what kind of mulch mix do I want, you know, what kind of weed, weed control, what kind of management do I want to do? In this case, looks like there's a full coverage, a full, you know, two to six inch layer of, of wood chip mulch on the ground. Um, so that's not necessarily providing 
a ton of ground nesting habitat. However, the diversity of plants, as well as the, the size of these plants is really good. There's a great diversity of plants here and it's just a well-designed landscape. Um, this bottom right photo here, this would be an example of something where I could see providing a lot more ground nesting habitat for bees. Um, you can see there's a lot, this gardener has a great variety of annual wildflower species. Um, you can see again that, that patchiness, that clump of habitat, clump of wildflowers. These clumps and patches are gonna have really great benefit because it basically makes the, the path of a bee's journey more efficient. It doesn't have to go from one corner of, one corner of the acre to the other to go from one flower to the next. You know, the way these, these wildflowers are planted, the bee does not have to go very far between one flower to the other. So it's, it's actually, it's ability to pollinate is going to be a lot more efficient because these plants are, are planted in these patches. Um, so it looks like just, you know, from a surface level, this garden is much more annual based. It's a much more seasonal garden. And it's also, it does look a lot more established um, than a lot of other gardens. So I'd say that in this photo, this is a year three or four garden to me. Um, and it's, and it looks to be very heavy on the, on the annual natives, um, which is also very fan, which, which is great. Um, and it does look like it's providing some good ground nesting habitat. And then just to really draw in the point again on these top right photos, on the most right photo, that's a surfed fly on blue-eyed grass, another great California native. Um, so these are, this is the hoverfly that I was talking about. Note just how translucent the wings are. And on the left, I believe that is another green sweat bee, and that's on a grindelia or a gumweed. Um, gumweed is a great Central Valley plant. It commonly grows in the grasslands and in the riparian areas of California Central Valley. Um, so that is a very locally available um, native that's, that really grows well in the Central Valley. So hopefully these examples were helpful. Um, the next aspect I want to touch out, touch on is that there are resources that are available to you um, for understanding what plants could be successful in wherever you are. Um, so I want to draw your attention to using the Xerxes Society as a resource. Um, the Xerxes Society, if you're not aware, is the Society for Invertebrate Conservation. They are the leading scientific and nonprofit authority on insects um, in the United States. They have developed plant lists for almost every region of the basically continental North America. And they have very specific plant lists for um, different biomes in California. So if you see here, recommended plants for pollinators and beneficial insects for the California Central Valley region. So this is a great list of native species that are very attractive. And the wonderful thing about these lists is if, I don't know if you can see that, but on the rightmost column under comments, you have the different types of, of pollinators that are attracted to these plants. So if you see a lot of these plants attract, you know, three or four or five different classes of either vertebrate or invertebrate pollinators. And I do believe that Anne is going to be sending out this list. Um, at the end of this presentation, um, which is great because this will give you an idea, especially for the Central Valley region people um, of plants that are around that are very, that are tried and true tested species to plant. Um, I know for a fact there's also plant lists for Southern California, there's a plant list for the Central Coast, and I believe there's a plant list for um, the Sierra Nevadas as well. So wherever you are in the state of California, there's a plant list that corresponds to where you're at. Um, so I definitely recommend going on the Xerxes Society website. They have a lot of books and library resources as well. Um, and they will give you a better idea of the, the species that are also at risk. Um, so if there's one thing I wanna get across is if you're looking for help, the Xerxes Society website is, is a fantastic resource and one that I use very regularly. Other resources that might be helpful to you, um, depending on your interest level in California natives and, and your knowledge level, Cal Flora could be a really great resource. They're another nonprofit that has an online database of California native plants. 
their website, calflora.org. Basically, you can type in any native plant and even a lot of non-native plants into their database and it will pop up with a map of, of basically observations of where it's found in the state. Um, these are observations that are completed by you know, the general public, by scientists, academics. Um, they upload you know, pictures and GPS coordinates of where they find these plants in the wild. And Calflora collects all that information and posts it on a really, uh, on a really um, awesome map. Um, also on Calflora, depending on your interest level and specific species, a lot of times they'll have a plant characteristics section where we'll actually tell you what insects and pollinators are attracted to these specific plants. So for example, if you go to you know, a milkweed and you click on that milkweed's characteristics, it will show bumblebees, you know, predatory insects, native bees, and, and it'll list the species of butterflies that are attracted to milkweed and mainly monarchs. Um, as well as they have a list of whether this plant is commercially available. If it is commercially available, they potentially have a list of native um, plant nurseries that do carry it. Um, but again, that list is just to kind of get you thinking and, and to reach out to them. Um, another, another resource that I'd say is really helpful for the, for the gardeners in the room that are looking to put in a native plant garden is the California Native Plant Society. They are um, a scientific organization that studies California natives. They also have a gardening um, section and they have local chapters in basically every county in California. Um, and they provide gardening tips. They provide virtual tours on their website. You can join a local chapter and they'll have native plant sales. So the California Native Plant Society, the plant sales that they have, those are very localized species that they're selling. And they're going to be a lot different than the large garden to variety stores. So if you do join a local chapter and you are looking to get native plants, their plant sales are fantastic for getting locally available seed and, and cuttings of plants. Um, so just another great resource that I wanted to bring to your attention. So wrapping it all up together, there are just a few key takeaways for how you can help. Um, number one thing, plant a diverse array of flowers and plant species. Um, going back to my overview of native plants, I'd say the best thing you can do for supporting a wide range of pollinators is planting species that, that flower year round. You know, don't focus on species that all plant in the same month, that all, excuse me, that all flower in the same month. You're gonna have a lot greater benefit if you have five to seven native species where the first one blooms in February and March and then through April, May, and then you have your final one or two that flower even through October or November. Um, that in itself, the, the diversity of, of plant species that flower throughout the growing season, that's gonna provide the most amount of food and forage for these pollinators. It's gonna provide the most amount of nutrition for them and for those ground and wood nesting bees that emerge for only a few weeks at a time, depending on when they emerge, there's gonna be something for them out there to access. Um, number two, create nesting sites for bees. This is something that you don't, you don't necessarily have to do in your own garden or your own house, um, but just a general understanding that bare ground is good. Not everything has to be either planted or mulched down to avoid weeds. Bare patches of ground here and there, are fantastic. Um, you know, even even natural areas, the bare ground there is going to be really crucial. You know, you don't necessarily have to provide 100% of the nesting sites for yourself, you know, by yourself by any means. Um, but just understanding that nesting sites um, are really important. Bare ground, you know, large dead standing trees, you know, tree trunks, you know, fallen branches, wood logs. These are all things that that bees and native pollinators can access. Um, and then number three is spread the word and create awareness about our pollinators. You know, take, take what information I hope you learned from this presentation and feel free to share it on social media. Feel free to create awareness both in your neighborhood and beyond. Um, I really wanted to show you those articles just to, you know, really bring home the fact that this is a hot topic issue. This is an important issue 
it's very much in the public eye right now. Um, and it's important to get that awareness and understanding, especially when understanding that the European honeybee is by no means the only pollinator out there. It's by, own, by no means the only economically important pollinator out there. Um, we're just beginning to understand the role that native insects play in pollinating crops like sunflowers and blueberries and watermelons and even almonds. Um, so really just spread the word and creating awareness about our pollinators is so important. And I believe with that, this is the final poll. So um, as a result of watching this webinar, I hope you've learned something from one of, from one of these bullet points here. Um, and I want to thank everyone for, for sticking in there and, and hanging in, hanging in and, and tuning into this presentation. Let's see if Anne can launch this poll. Okay, uh, Chris, it looks like she's having some problems. So okay. this is Ro, just real quickly. Um, in, in your own mind, you can kind of say, after you watch this, um, did you learn a lot more about native bees than you did before? Are you excited about plant native, about to plant native plants and pollinators in your garden? And are you planning to leave some bare ground in the garden for nesting bees? So kind of in your own mind, decide which, which ones are you going to try? Um, someone's saying yes, yes, and yes, which thank you very much for letting us know. Uh, that's great. And um, in fact, it's interesting because when I was going through the questions, Chris, there's quite a bit about the bare ground and the nesting bees. So I think you've got okay. a lot of interest in that. Um, Fantastic. Yes. So can, shall I flip over to the questions real quickly? Do you have a time for a drink of water? And uh, yeah, yes to all. Yes to all. Great class. Thank you from Julie. Ted says yes, yes, yes. Um, great audience. Excellent presentation. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yes. Everyone's so nice. Yeah. We are. They not well, but it was a wonderful <laughs> presentation. And I'm sure even people who knew a lot have come away with extra information. I just found it so fascinating. Thank you. Um, so get your drink of Thank water you, because I'm going to start asking some questions. How's okay. that? Okay. Okay. I have the Q&A open. Okay. Um, well, there's a kind of a two-parter. It's from Rachel and Brian. And Rachel first says, leaving bare ground for ground nesting bees, how far away should the area be from high foot traffic? Does it matter if it's sunny or shady? And then going into Brian's part, is there a soil type or condition we should leave to make it more likely for them to use? Wow, so so, those are really great. Those are really great, great questions. Oh, all of the questions are good. I'm sorry, but you're going to be here for a while. <laughs> Everyone's got really, really well thought out questions. Yeah. So um, to answer Rachel's question, for, I guess I'll answer that one first. Um, I guess how far away it should be is anywhere where they're going to be less, less susceptible to ground dis disturbance. So Really, the, the reason why ground nesting bees are very at risk for disturbing their nest habitat is because they're in areas of high disturbance. So when you're raking or digging or, you know, stomping through compaction or, or spraying, like if you're doing any weed control on, you know, road or sidewalk edges, um, those types of things are probably where they're at most risk. Um, so I guess if, you're, if you yourself are, are creating those areas, I'd say put it in an area where you're not going to, where you or others are not going to be susceptible to stepping on that patch. So I'd leave it a few, I'd leave that bare patch away from, you know, a sidewalk or a, or a path or, or, or a field or field border or field edge. Um, because really the, the big issue is when people start raking or digging um, or if you have animals, if let's say you have livestock or, you know, a dog or something like that, you know, I'd say plant them in or have those areas and just patchy, you know, areas. You by no means need to have just a giant section of bare patchy ground. Okay. You know, I don't think they're, they're that picky, um, but just far enough away to avoid um, that ground disturbance. And then okay. Brian's question about soil type. Mm -hmm. I'd say that, th that ground nesting bees typically prefer sandier soils in general. The, mm -hmm. the clay or heavier soils, it's going to be a lot harder for them to burrow. Um, and a lot of times the, the well-drained sandy soils are very easy for them to make holes in. 
Um, so that soil type, I'd say, is probably the most, the general, the general soil texture would mm -hmm. be sandy soils. Okay. And what about sun and shade? Is that an issue? Yeah, so I'd say that um, full sun to partly shade. I, I wouldn't say there is really a shade requirement. Okay. I, it, it's really kind of interesting with, with especially bees. When bees are out pollinating, they prefer to be in full sun. You know, but when they're when they're underground, I'd say for them, the big thing is just the temperature, the soil temperature. Um, so I, I think it's really one way or the other. I don't necessarily know the, the best way, but you can't go wrong with any option, really, in my opinion. Great. OK, wonderful. OK, Ken wants to know, are there plants that are harmful or not helpful to pollinators? That's a great question. Yeah. And it's such an interesting question because it's it's very much not well understood because we don't know what an insect is thinking. You know, we don't know what it dislikes versus what it likes. Even you, you know, we don't, don't know that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, even I don't know that. I would say that the, the ones that are going to be harmful or not helpful are the ones that are very invasive in the state of California. If you look at things like... Um, the, a rice, I'm sorry, ricin, what is, castor bean is what I'm thinking of. Okay. Castor bean is like a weedy highway yeah. plant. It, it, it's really nasty and it's, and you know, it is a poisonous plant. I'd say plants that are, are plants that are harmful to pollinators are the ones that outcompete California native plants. So if you look at, let's say, let's take the yellow star thistle, for example. Yellow star thistle is a, is a very voracious invasive. It overtakes native pasture and rangeland, although it is very attractive to pollinators. But when you look at what pollinators it actually attracts, it's mainly European honeybee because it's a thistle that's found in Europe. So when you're looking at something like yellow star thistle, yes, it does have a pollinator benefit, but it outcompetes plants that would naturally grow in, in native grasslands that would be more beneficial to native pollinators. Okay, so checking, so hopefully those, lists, that, so hopefully checking those lists that you we were talking about would be real beneficial, mm -hmm. wouldn't it? Yeah, and I'd say be, be aware of the invasive species in California oh. um, because, I mean, those do, a lot of those do actually provide pollinator benefit, but mm -hmm. the ones that outcompete the native species are going to be the ones that ha I'd say have the most quantifiable negative impact on pollinators. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, someone want, okay, Tristan wants to know about creating a bee hotel near my garden. How can I make sure the holes get occupied by bees instead of spiders and cobwebs? Ah, oh, this is a picky, <laughs> a picky, picky landlord. Yes, totally. Let's see. I'm, I'm thinking Tristan might have already had a, a spider invasion <laughs> in his bee nest. That's why he's asking this question. Um, I'd say that, that um, the bee hotels are, are really interesting. Um, I'd say it's important to have a variety of, of hole sizes in your bee hotel um, because you're going to have different species of bees occupying them. Um, Really, with the bee hotels, it's so difficult to to understand how successful those man-made, you know, bee structures are. A lot of times, they can be very beneficial, but I think it's really luck of the draw with what's with what's around. For example, I mean, the bee hotels that are most successful are the ones that are lucky enough to have a, an abundance of bee species already in the area. Okay. So if you're Let's say you build a bee hotel and you live in downtown Los Angeles. Well, your bee hotel is not going to attract the same amount of bee species as, let's say, you're, you know, out in the country in mm -hmm. Sonoma County, you know. Mm -hmm. So I'd say it, it, it really depends. The, the best thing would probably be just to have a variety of, of drill hole sizes between larger for like a bumblebee and smaller for like a small sweat bee or cuckoo bee or something like that. Okay, great. Okay, uh, 
Christy wants to know, are there other pollinators that are declining in the same regions as the rusty patch? That was early on in your speech, in your, in your, in your information, but um, we've been holding on to that one for a while. Yeah. So in general, um, in that region, I'm not, I'm not too sure what other pollinators are in decline in that area. I know that um, in Hawaii, they're having a lot of issues with pollinator decline for native Hawaiian bee species. I believe that in Hawaii, there are four species of bumblebee that are currently on the endangered species list. In that East Coast, Midwest region, I'm not, to be honest, I'm not very familiar with the pollinators and flora that are found there. Um, so I'm not, I'm not really sure what else in that area is declining. Um, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I, I, can get a, I can get an answer to this question later too. Right, well, you know so much, you know, that, that, that I understand. Um, okay, we have a really interesting one from, okay, I'm going to probably, Marley, I'm hoping I'm getting your name right. Um, I, I can't tell exactly. What happens to ground dwelling bees when the spring wildflowers are done blooming? That's a great question. So the ground dwelling bees, um, once they emerge, from their nests, um, when they have that few week window to, to provide pollination services, um, mm -hmm. once that cycles over, they really focus on um, collecting those pollen grains and putting it back into their nest. So once those wildflowers are done blooming, they're basically looking, their life cycle is basically over and they're looking to provide um, the, they're, they're looking to provide, provide the nutrition for their eggs um, to be able to access and then go through that, you know, metamorphosis back into that, um, back into that insect again. So, you know, that mining, that mining bee in that example, you know, once it's few weeks are kind of up, it's a, it's basically like an evolutionary cue where it's telling itself, okay, I'm collecting pollen. I'm putting it back into my nest. Now I'm going to go back and, and basically, I think they, I think a lot of times they, they die in their, either in their burrow or directly adjacent, but they have those pollen grains that they collect and they put in there and they lay their eggs directly on top of it. Okay. So once they're, once they've laid their eggs, mm -hmm. their life cycle is basically over. With those insects, their goal is basically to survive and reproduce for the next generation. Um, so they're a lot different with, anim with mammals and large animals that typically care for their young through the years. Once they've laid their eggs and collected their pollen grains, their life cycle's over, um, essentially. Well, they, they have a, a, a symbiotic relationship with the, 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 between the, the, the bee that's not going to live much longer and the plant that's not going to bloom much longer. Anyway, moving yeah, on, basically. okay? Thank you. Um, this is an interesting one from Patty. Are porous rocks used by pollinators? That's a great question. Yeah. I, I, have, I have no idea, to be honest okay. with you. I, <laughs> I unfortunately don't. I, I wonder, I'm not sure if it would. Um, I'm thinking like pumice or something like a volcanic pumice or something. Um, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't see that as, I wouldn't necessarily think that as much just based on, yeah, I, that's a great question. You know, I, that's definitely something that we could follow up on too. Okay, all right. Okay, well, um, just about went through everything. Um, there, I just can't thank you enough, Chris, and I, Everyone else is thumbs up and applauding right now. Um, and of course, um, I've got, we've got some raised hands. I don't know what that's for. I'm sorry. I can, I'm, I'm trying to read everything I possibly can. But, <laughs> no problem. Okay, but um, this has been wonderful. Um, I know Anne's going to be sending this information out to everyone. And unless there's anything else, um, I just want to thank you again. And I'm sure everyone who was here this evening thanks you and look forward to a, another wonderful uh, webinar from you. 
thank you so much, Ro. I really appreciate it. And, and thank you everyone for coming. I, I really enjoyed doing this. I'm, I wish that was, this was in better circumstances where we could, you know, interact face to face and see everyone's faces. Um, but yeah, I, I really appreciate you inviting me and, and glad that I was able to do this talk. Oh, thank you. And Anne, do you have any, any closing comments you'd like to make? Yeah, sure. Thanks again, Chris. We uh, so appreciate your knowledge and your passion and enthusiasm. It really comes out. And I think it's inspiring people to plant more for pollinators and for starters go, okay, what is a pollinator? And now go out in their garden and start spotting these different insects. One person did ask how they could identify pollinators and I answered their question uh, by typing, but also uh, we're going to send out more resources so that you can find out, um, you know, how to identify the local pollinator. So we're excited that people are interested in doing that. This call, um, this presentation will be um, added to YouTube in the next 10 days. We have a YouTube channel um, that is in, um, going to also be in the email, so you can subscribe to our channel. And one last thing is um, for those of you who are local, so Stanislaus County will be sending out a survey to ask you about the program impacts um, that, um, you know, what you've learned from this call. And it's going to come to you in about three months. So by the time you've forgotten about everything, uh, we're going to ch check in on you and see, are you planting more for pollinators? Are you recognizing more pollinators and that kind of thing? So Thanks again, everybody, and um, tune in mm -hmm. in June. We're going to be doing a class on herbs in partnership with the Stanislaus County Library, and we're really excited about that. So, um, Chris, Ro, do you have any closing words, and we'll go from there. Thank you so much, Chris. I appreciate this so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, if anyone has any questions, um, feel free to ask Anne or Ro, and then we'll do our best to follow up with you. Great. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night, and we'll see you next month. If you uh, aren't already subscribed, make sure you subscribe to our Stanislaus Sprout uh, blog. Take care, and good night. <laughs>